This series is based upon John chapter 20, verse 30, which says this. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. So we talked about the first half of the series was about looking at the, the signs that were in the gospel of John. But these, specific, specifically the ones in the gospel of John, were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so now the second part of the series, which we're, we're coming to an end to, we are talking about the ones that were not recorded in the Gospel of John. And we've gone through all kinds of signs. All the CDs are there in the, at, the, at the media center if you'd like to catch up with some of those things. Uh, but last week we, ta- we tackled something very specific as we are addressing the transfiguration of Jesus. How many of you have heard of and read read the transfiguration of Jesus. Let me see a couple of hands. So not everybody has ever heard of this. This is good. It's awesome. So as you're turning there, this is actually a part of the gospel story. It's recorded in three of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all document this moment. And it's an historical moment, not only for the gospels, but actually in human history. It's a, it's an historical moment. It's, and so we're going to read about that. But last week, I specifically spent some time in dealing with uh, what it meant that Jesus was the Messiah and what that means. And so I put it, I put it very simply like this. Uh, the Messiah is a term that progressively came about out of a collective of Old Testament prophecies concerning God sending and appointing one man over all of humanity. And so uh, God, from the very beginning of mankind falling, had said that he was very uh, subtly at first, but began to speak about someone's going to come. Someone's going to send someone. Someone's going to come. And so at first it subtly came, but it began to become more aggressive. And it became more and more. Someone's coming. Someone's coming. The prophets are all talking about this amazing prophecy of this, this, this amazing man. And so uh, who we have found to finally be the word that we use, Messiah. Messiah is a word from the Hebrew word Mashiach, which means to be anointed. And so when they would anoint a king, uh, a prophet, or a priest, they would anoint them with oil, signifying that God had appointed them to have authority to do his will and to do what he asked them to do. And so uh, the Messiah would would be three things. The Messiah would be a prophet who speaks for God and would speak the very commands of God. The prophet would be a priest who would intercede for humans and more specifically would be the mediator between God and humanity. And he would also be a king who would govern over all of creation. And so this is who this person was projected to be, this mighty prophet, priest, king. And we as Christians, or the word Christian actually means Christ I ands. Christ is the word for Messiah. So we're actually, when we say we're Christian, we're we're saying we are Messiah ands. We believe that Jesus is the Messiah. The lowly, born of Nazareth, Jesus. Jesus who died on a cross 2,000 years ago, who came, he was the Messiah of God. And so we were looking at what that, what that meant, who he was before he came. And some of the words that, some of the, the titles Jesus had was that Jesus was the son of David. He was born of human royalty. And he was born of divine lordship. That's what the word son of David means. Is that Jesus would be born a descendant of David, receiving his kingship. And also that David referred to this person who would be his descendant was not lower than him, but actually was from beforehand. Someone who was, he refers to as Lord. And so this person who is the son of David is actually the Lord who, who was before David. And then we also saw the son of God, right? We talked about how Jesus was not born the son of God. 
Remember I made that statement last week that Jesus was not born the Son of God? Some of you are a little bit like, what? For real, Jesus was not born because Jesus has always been the eternal Son of God. He has always been the Son. It's not like when he became a human, he became the Son of God. He had always existed. He was the Word of God beforehand. And so uh, he became flesh. He was born a son of David. We read that in Romans chapter 1. That's what Paul preached, that Jesus was born a son of David, but was revealed at, after his resurrection. It was revealed in demonstrating his power that he was the eternal son of God. And so the son of God is of divine likeness also, which means that the son of God projects what God is like. If you want to know what God is like, you need to know his son. And then also that the Son of God meant that, that divine, I use that word divine exclusivity, which means that Jesus only is the only legitimate Son. Everybody else, all of us are just adopted. Sorry. So when we say that we're children of God, we are, but we are only children of God on one condition, that we believe in Jesus. You're not a child of God because you were born a child of God. Nobody on human earth was ever born a child of God. You were born a creature of God. But to be, a, to be a child, you must be adopted. And adoption only comes through Jesus, who is the only legit son. Amen? Amen. These are, these are and we're going to get more into it tonight. Um, and it also means that Jesus was also the son of man, that he was, and the son of man is specifically talking about the son of man in Daniel, who was projected to being God-like. He was this human who was actually put on the very same level as God. That's, that's almost like, in some ways, to the Hebrew mind, that's almost heretical. Because who can, who can sit on the same seat as God? What man can do that? But God gave a vision of some man sitting exactly equal with him. And that was the biggest claim that Jesus made when in his earthly ministry was that people were saying is that you make yourself equal with God. He was the son of man. And that the son of man would also have God-like authority. That he would actually speak as if he was God and declare things as if he had authority exclusively from God. And so that's what it meant to be the son of man. So son of David, son of man, son of God, all terms used to Jesus. And now we turn to Matthew, uh, uh, Luke chapter 9. Last week we were at Matthew 16 and we left off at that statement that Jesus made that kind of leaves all of us a little bit like, what does Jesus mean by that? He said... Verse 28, truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That's what he says in Matthew 16, 28. And now, my question is, what does Jesus mean by that statement right there? What does he mean by saying to some of his disciples would see him coming in the clouds of, of, of his glory and his kingdom? What does that mean? When did that happen? That's my question. When did that happen? Was that, did that happen at some point that we never heard of in the Gospels? Did that happen at his resurrection? I don't know. That doesn't seem to be what Jesus meant by that. And if if it was, all of his disciples saw it. So I didn't, I was like, nah, that doesn't make sense there either. Well, when Jesus says this, the story that follows after is the transfiguration. Meaning this statement that Jesus said when he said some of them would see him come, the Son of Man would come in his kingdom, he meant something there. And, he, and we talked about the kingdom last week too, what the kingdom meant. It meant that the king's authority, the king's dominion, that he would see him come with the king's dominion. So what is, what is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the transfiguration. Let's read in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 28. You go to Luke 29, Luke 29, Luke 9, verse 28. This is eight days after. So about eight days after Jesus said this, what he just said, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. So that would be the sum that Jesus was talking about. And now he's going to show them his kingdom, his, his dominion, his authority. So they went up to pray. Eight days after, Jesus said, Son, I'm coming. I'm gonna, some of you are going to see this before you ever taste death. And, and here he takes Peter, James, and John, 
who you know are always taken with him whenever it's like a private session. Not all 12 always went. Only three went. There's this little exclusive party here. And these three came on the mountain, and they begin to pray. This is an intense prayer meeting. How many of you would love to be in a prayer meeting with Jesus? That's an awesome. But I'll tell you, it's gonna t- it, doesn't, it doesn't just happen like five minutes. Jesus prayed a long time. He would spend hours, if not um, long sessions of time on a mountain praying to the Father. Amen? And so here, when you, it's going to cost you to pray with Jesus. I just want you to know that. You don't just go up for five minutes on a mountain. It, you spend time there praying, waiting for the Father, seeing what, what's going to happen. And remember, they had just, Jesus had just asked him from last week. He had asked them, hey, do you believe that I'm the Messiah? Who do people say that I am? And they said, we believe that you're Messiah. But then he told them what would happen to the Messiah. And then Peter kind of objected. He got rebuked. Right? And then Jesus warned him about what it's going to require for you to follow him, that you have to give up your life to follow Jesus. Amen? I don't know if you know that, but you're not, you're not called to save your life. You're not called to hold on to your life. The only way that you will ever save your life or find life is by losing your life. We have no life in this world. Right? Our life is made for Jesus. That's what we were created for. And so here we, here we are. Jesus is praying, and here's verse 29. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. So they're praying, and all of a sudden, Jesus starts changing. And Matthew, the word that Matthew uses is where we, where we get the word, he was transfigured. That word in Greek is the word metamorpho, which means changing form in keeping with the inner reality or tra- to be transformed. Where, where, do you, where have you ever heard that word metamorpho before? We get the word, it's where we get the, word, the, the English word metamorphosis, right? Some of you are right. What happens to a caterpillar when he goes in his cocoon? He goes through the process of metamorphosis and turns into what? A butterfly. We know that, right? We, we see that. That's a part of creation that's there. Here Jesus is transfiguring. He is, he is metamorphing into this different appearance. He is changing his form. And it begins to continue to say, as his clothes began, became as bright as a flash of lightning. Now think about a flash of lightning right now. When a flash of lightning happens, what happens to you? Well, you're blinded, but you, you notice it, right? It's bright. It's something. So imagine lightning power is now manifesting from Jesus as he's praying. That would freak you out, huh? Like you, you, don't even, you wouldn't even know what to do with that. Right? You would be scared because think we're we're already scared of just a little little flash of lightning. Imagine if Jesus just started, like he just started transforming into this light that we've never seen before. Right? It would it would it would it would it would scare you. I, I dare to say it would scare it would literally scare the hell out of you. Like literally. <laughs> it would that like you would just it would just scare everything out of you. You would be a believer right there and then, right? Right? Literally. Um and so, and, and, but look what he continues to say. That's, that, you would say that alone is like weird, right? Like just to say that Jesus transfigured out of nowhere while he's praying. But look what he continues to say. Then it says, two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. So Jesus is now transfiguring into this lightning power being and now they're, they're, the, the, the disciples wake up to Moses and Elijah standing there. Now, I have no idea how they knew it was Moses and Elijah. Maybe Moses was holding the Ten Commandments, and Elijah was in his chariot of fire, right? That's what they're known for, okay? But my question, right, and so they're talking with Jesus, right? And they were glor- they're, in, they're in some glorious splendor. They seem to be honored in that moment. And, but my question was, why Moses and Elijah? Why not Abraham or Isaiah or any other person? Like, why Moses and Elijah? Well, there, there have been different people who have said different things on this. Some people have said, well, Moses represents the law and Elijah represents the prophets. And that's a, I guess that's a good thing to say. I, I, don't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put it like that. I think it's a lot deeper than that. Um, Certainly that may be a point, but I think it's much more than that. 
And so I want you to real quickly go to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi is, or, or the, the way I say it is Malachi. He's the Italian prophet. Just kidding. That was a terrible joke. <laughs> Malachi. Uh, Malachi chapter 4, or Malachi for the Hebrew, right? And um, so, so Malachi is the last prophet in the Old Testament who ever spoke, Okay? Whoever spoke, and there was 400 years of silence up to the point that Jesus came, or John the Baptist, I should say, started talking and preaching the kingdom. But Malachi is the last person. And look in Malachi chapter 4, look at the very last prophecy that he spoke. Very last thing. I mean, after this, silence for 400 years. Okay? It's written, and all people know is when they come to thinking like the most, the freshest prophecy off the off of God's mouth was Malachi. That's it. After Malachi, it's shh, silence, nothing else. Okay? Nobody got up and spoke for God anymore. Nobody had the spirit come on them and start thinking things about the Messiah. It was just Malachi. And here's the last thing he said in chapter 4. He says this, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. I'm reading out of the New King James Version. And all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, and they will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, that is a Messiah name, by the way. It's a messianic title. Think about why they use that title. Sun is the brightest star. It's the, it's, it's the, 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 the closest thing to the earth that projects the most amount of light, which we would talk would refer to as glory. So here when they say son of righteousness, they're talking about the glory, the light of what, what God approves of. Righteousness means to be standing right with God. So here the Messiah would project this light of, what God, of who God approves, right? Of righteousness. The son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like staff. Stall-fed calves. In other words, we would be, we would be well-fed. We would have joy. We would be like uh, uh, sheep who are well-fed. And so, verse 3, You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on that day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Key in verse 4. Remember the law of who? Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and the judgments. Quick note on that. One of the things about the statutes and the judgments is that in the middle of it, Deuteronomy 18, God told Moses, I'm going to raise up a new prophet from among the Israelites, someone like you, but who's greater than you, and who would actually represent and actually come from me. He will speak the very words of God. So it's not, it's not it, it really, I was like, wow, look, Malachi is telling, telling people, look, Moses spoke about the prophet, the Messiah who would come. And so here he says, remember what Moses said in his statutes. Remember what he said. Remember all the commands and all the things he said. Then he continues to say, which I commanded in Horeb. Behold, I will send who? Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So why do you think on this moment when Jesus is saying that I'm going to show you my coming of my kingdom. I'm going to display my authority and my power and my glory on this, this prayer meeting. That there is Moses and Elijah. The transfiguration is the fulfillment of this moment here in Malachi. And actually, right after this transfiguration, the, they begin to start talking to Jesus. Hey, I thought Elijah was to come. And Jesus tells them, well, Elijah did come. It was John the Baptist. And now I'm taking over and moving forward with what, what was supposed to happen. I'm the son of righteousness that was to come and bring healing in his wings. Does that make sense? So here, that's why Moses and Elijah are there. Moses and Elijah, Elijah's glorious appearing brings authenticity to Jesus being the Messiah of God in this moment. The transfiguration was about revealing Jesus' eternal glory to his disciples Moses and Elijah confirm Malachi 4 and are the highest honored prophets 
of the scriptures. If you were to talk about the, if you were to name some of the highest prophets on, to a Hebrew mind in the first century, first two off the bat, Moses and Elijah. First bat. Why? Well, Moses and Elijah were both people who God used to demonstrate his power and miraculous signs. Moses uh, brought down um, di- uh, all kinds of curses and disasters to, the, to Pharaoh and Egypt. All right? He also parted the sea, right? He also made rock come out of a, water come out of a rock. He also made, a, 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 he put a, a serpent on a pole and people were healed. I mean, there's all kinds of things that God did through Moses. Moses' hands had to be lifted high to keep the battle to continue to win. So there's all kinds of things that, that people project Moses. Moses gave the law. Moses spent a numerous amount of time spending on the mountain with God. Uh, Moses was actually the speaker for God in his time. So Moses is one of the greatest prophets of the scriptures. Elijah, Elijah called down fire from heaven. He did all kinds of crazy things. So when we think of the highest exalted honored prophets, the ones who actually spent time with God, it was Elijah and Moses. Uh, Elijah's, Elijah and Moses were both men of prayer. Both of them called upon mighty acts of God. They were legends according to scripture. And so for Moses and Elijah to be there would have would, to be in the presence of Jesus would have gave complete, complete authenticity to what they were seeing in that moment. But we haven't even merely, we've merely cracked what, what I'm trying to get to the point of. Let's continue to read. Um, verse 31. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to the fulfillment at Jerusalem. What, what fulfillment, what, what departure is they talking about? Well, he said already earlier the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. In other words, he was telling them the gospel, what he was about to do. Not only for the disciples or for you and me, he did that for Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah, they had heard about somebody coming. They didn't know who it was, but they're, they're now seeing that this is what God's plan was all along, the gospel that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would die on the cross for all of humanity's sins who believe in his name. And there you have it. Moses and Elijah are seeing their Messiah, the person they were waiting for. They're seeing this man who's going to take upon their sin and die for them. That's powerful. I don't know if you get that. But let's continue to read. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. Notice Luke says his glory, not their glory. You notice that, right? It doesn't say that they saw their glory. He says his glory, talking about Jesus. Now look what he continues to say. As the men were leaving, Jesus, Peter said to, uh, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here, which is, that's good. Like he's like, this is awesome, right? This is so awesome. I'm seeing Moses and Elijah nobody's going to believe me, right? Imagine if you saw a celebrity and you come back and tell all your friends. Anybody going to believe you? Probably not. Like if you saw, I don't know, I'm not going to name anybody. But let's say you saw somebody, most, I, I met a celebrity one time, most people are already like, you didn't see that guy, right? Let alone when I have to tell them that he actually touched my shoulder, right? I'm like, yeah, he touched my shoulder, right? They don't believe me. They're like, dude, I barely believe that you even met that person, right? But it's this, it, it, Think about this moment. They're seeing Elijah and Moses, and they're seeing Jesus transformed into, like, electricity light, right? That's powerful. I mean, you can't even explain this moment. But this actually really happened on that sacred mountain of prayer. Look look what he continues to say. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, right? Like, this is a historical moment. He did not know what he was saying. Praise the Lord that he forgives us even when we don't know what we're saying. We can say really dumb things in our moments of just, but, but it, and, it, and you know, some people will read that and go, why did Peter say that, right? That's idolatry, to, to set up an altar for Moses and Elijah. No, it was okay for him to say that. He didn't know what he was saying. That's why, the, that's why Luke is saying that. It's okay. Jesus is not losing his cool. But look what ver- happens in th- verse 34. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Or in Matthew, Matthew's version, I like better. It says, This is my son whom I love. 
With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Where have we heard that before? Where God says, at his baptism, right? We've heard that before. So let me read that to you. When all the people were baptized in Luke 3, earlier in Luke, baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him and boldly formed like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. Isaiah 42 verse 1 says this about the Messiah. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. So here we always talk about the baptism is where God says, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. But most people forget the transfiguration is where God also said it as well. And so I wanted, I wanted to take some time to look at that. Before we do that, though, go to 2 Peter Chapter 1, if you can. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Peter actually wrote about the transfiguration in his epistle. 1 Peter chapter 1. The disciples for a moment thought that they were experiencing something extravagant. They actually got to see Moses and Elijah, some of the greatest servants, and yet God came to them and told them that this is about Jesus. Moses and Elijah were not, for the, were not there for the disciples They were there to see Jesus. God had revealed to Jesus that he would die, and now he was sharing this with God's servants. So the disciples were the same in this moment of the transfiguration. They were the same as Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah were not there at the transfiguration for the disciples. Moses and Elijah were there, like the disciples, to share in that moment, this glorious moment of being like Jesus, of seeing Jesus in his glory. Look what 1 Peter says in uh, 2 Peter, excuse me, did I say 1 Peter? 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. <clears throat> and then we're going to close. <clears throat> 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. For we did not allow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, you can either think that Peter's just being, you know, like talking big language there, but he's not. He's just talking about what happened at the transfiguration. When did they see his majesty? At the transfiguration, look what he says. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, what? This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. When did that happen? At, John, at, at the baptism? G, pa, Peter's not talking about the baptism. He's talking about transfiguration. Why do I say that? Because he says right afterwards, we ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. You see that? This moment was a moment for them that was a game changer for the disciples. For, for specifically, Peter, James, and John. Game changer. They saw Jesus, they saw God the Father give him honor, glory, and praise. They they said this is all, God the Father basically told them, this is all about Jesus. Forget Moses and Elijah. This is about Jesus. And so my question was like, what, what does God mean when he says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, whom I love, listen to him. What does he mean by that? So, Verse 19 in, 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 in 2 Peter says this, because of that experience, that experience that they had on the sacred mountain, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. He's talking about the scriptures. You must pay close attention to what they wrote, for their words are like a what? A lamp shining in a dark place until the, dawns, the, the day dawns and Christ the morning star shines in your hearts. It, doesn't that language, morning star shines in your heart, sound like the language from Malachi, son of righteousness? I mean, I mean, like, same language. Jesus being this light that's projected. And it comes first from you reading scripture. That's what Peter pointed to. Peter goes, these scriptures, they're a lamp for your feet till you get to the point that when you look up, the day dawns before you and you see what this is all about. This is all about Jesus. That's what this points to. 
So if you read the scriptures, my friend, you, you, you know, for example, I'll basically put it like this. Not everyone will experience the transfiguration that Peter says. Peter knew that. This is an experience, but Peter knew this experience, and we're all, we're all not going to have transfiguration, probably. We're not going to go to our rooms tonight and pray, and then all of a sudden Jesus is going to transfigure before us. Um, I, hardly, I don't know if that will happen, but Peter does point to his readers, hey, read the scriptures, because if you do, you will begin to see the transformation of the resurrected Jesus in your life. You will begin to see his light. You will, you will be, it will be revealed to you. You know who Jesus is. Just remember the message of the prophets. So um, we, not everyone will experience the transfiguration. I, I said that just to, you know, I don't know. I'm not going to say no one will ever. Not, I don't know anybody would. But everyone can experience the transformation through the resurrected Jesus. Peter points to the scriptures as the guide that will lead you to Jesus. And so as we wrap up, I want to just tell you what the scriptures say for us to just real quickly, what does it mean that God says, this is my son, whom I love, whom I'm well pleased, listen to him. And so we're going to end here. This is, this is where we end. What does it mean that God says this specifically? Because Peter repeats it. God said it twice. And we, we got, that means we got to get it. We got to live by this little revelation that God gives that everything is about. This is my son, whom I love, whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And so I'm just going to break down those three words. First off, this is my son. A son in Hebrew culture is that was understood as someone who is the heir of God. And to be an heir means you are inheritance. And so all, the th- all that belongs to the father will be inherited by the son. Now, here's the question. If everything belongs to God the father, what do you think Jesus will inherit? Everything. Everything is to Jesus. Jesus would make claims like this. For example, uh, John 1.18, no one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is the closest relationship with the Father has made him known. John 5.23, moreover, the Father judges no one but has what? Entrusted all judgment to the Son that all, all may honor the Son. Every, all may honor the Son. All people may honor the Son. Just as they honor the Father, whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent me. I mean, and I'll, I'll even put some other verses in there just to make it even more clear. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. That's John six forty six. All that belongs to the Father is mine. John sixteen fifteen. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and to who, those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So my bottom line point is that Jesus is from God and, in fact, is God, and he is the only legit Son. So when God said, this is my Son, that means nobody else is. That means Buddha ain't the Son. That means Muhammad ain't the Son. That means the Pope. Nobody. Nobody. Nobody is the son, right? I'm not down in the Pope. I love the Pope. He's, you know, but you know, I pray for everybody. But, um, this, but, this, but there's only one son. There's only one person who is the son. That is, that is Jesus. That's it. That's it. And once you get that, that God has said, this is my son. No one else is my son. Then we all know who we need to come to if we want to be God's family. That's, that's what God is trying to make clear. Okay, so when he says... God didn't just say, this is my son. He said, this is my son whom I love. Think about that. God, God never, if you think about this, very rarely will you ever hear God the Father say to any specific person, I love you in Scripture. You know, I really see a lot of that going on. You only see God make that bold claim about Jesus specifically. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that God never said, I don't love the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But but. God's love is directly connected to Jesus and his sole love for Jesus, whom he refers to as his beloved. When you talk about someone being your beloved, what what is that language? It means like Jesus is God's favorite. This is his his favorite. This is what it means to be the only begotten. That's what that word means. It means only unique son. It means no one one is on the same level as Jesus. No one. No one. And I'll explain a little bit about that. But look what Jesus says about himself and the Father's love for him. He says, John 3.35, the Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. John 3.35, 
For the Father loves the Son and shows him all, all he does. John 5.20. The reason my Father love, uh, loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. Uh, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's command and remain in his love. John 15, 9 through 10. So you see that Jesus made this exclusive love to himself that the Father has for the Son, and that that love radiates to the world that way. You cannot, you cannot feel or understand the love of God except through Jesus Christ. No way. You cannot say, I love God, I know that God loves me, and then you don't believe in Jesus. No way. Or you have no relationship, or you have no knowledge of him. No way. Only way you can ever understand God's love, and God and the gospel has made it clear, this is love, that Jesus Christ came and laid down his life for his friends. They'll repeat it again, that Jesus Christ came, this is what love is, that Jesus the Messiah came and died for sinners. This is how love is expressed. It's not just something outside of Jesus. Jesus is the embodiment of understanding God's love. For God so loved the world, how is that understood? He gave his only begotten son. You understand? And so, so this is whom he loves. Think, now think about this. With whom, him I am well pleased. Jesus is sinless. God is completely satisfied with the life of Jesus. Jesus never disobeyed God ever. He never disobeyed God once ever in glory. He never disobeyed the moment he became a baby. He never disobeyed God the moment he took his last breath on the cross. He never disobeyed in his resurrection. Have, what about us? We've disobeyed since we took first morning breath. Jesus never once, not one millisecond, sinned. Ever. Ever. That's, our, that's the gospel claim. I'll give you, I'll give you scripture. 1 Peter 1.19, it was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. 1 Corinthians 5.21, for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering of our to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. The, uh, Hebrews 4.15, the, 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 this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses for he's faced all of the same testings as we do. It means he was tempted in every way like us. Yet, he did not sin. Hebrews 7.26, he is the kind of high priest we need because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He has been set apart from sinners and he has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. Jesus always with his life worshiped and pleased God the Father. We never once ever pleased God the Father. Never once. Every breath we took was our own. We were selfish. We just thought this life was our own. Right? It's what it means. It doesn't just sinning, being a sinner doesn't just mean that you sin. It means you don't worship God. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. No one pleases God. No one is righteous. No one. You, I know I have a son. I have a newborn son. My son does not please God. My son is not born righteous with God. My son is eventually going to need to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He'll come to that place where he need that. I know that he's going to sin one day. I've already made it up in my mind. I'm like, he's going to sin. He's going to sin. And he's, it's going to come out of him. Amen? But, I'm, but the only one who has ever been pleasing to God, always, Jesus. Amen. Always. And that's good because guess what? We have a Savior. We have somebody that we know will stand for us. This sinless Jesus doesn't stand and say, I'm sinless and you're not. This sinless Jesus comes and says, I came to forgive you and make you right. By my sinlessness, now imparts to you. Because you believe and trust in me. And so I end with what it means to listen to him. It, John 1, 1, 3. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and he was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing has made that has not been made. Hebrews 1, 1, 3, as I end, this is what it means that we are to listen to Jesus. It says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets many times in various ways, but in the last days, he has spoken to us by who? His son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through him, 
also made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. We are called to listen to Jesus and do what he says because four things. He is from God. He is God. God's love can only be found in Jesus, and Jesus has never sinned. On these basis are we to believe that Jesus is the Messiah and is the which we have life and we have hope of knowing when we die, we are going to be with him in heaven. Amen. And so, let's stand together. So let me just tell you really quickly, Let's hold hands, by the way. Uh, Let's hold hands. I hope that by hearing the word of God that you have been transformed. And I hope that I've overwhelmed you with the knowledge of Christ and who he actually is. The transfiguration of Jesus is to call us to our transformation. That's the point. And so all of us who have sinned have the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. That's 2 Corinthians 3.18. Romans 12.1 for transformation. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And the way you think has to change by how you see Jesus. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And why is God's will good, pleasing, and perfect? Because Jesus is good, pleasing, and perfect for you. So when you know Jesus, you know God's perfect will for your life. All things will be given to us if we ask in his name because we trust in him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our time together. Jesus, I just ask for all of us tonight as we have heard the word of God that we would be transformed by the Bible, that we'd be transformed by your scriptures, that we would have, that we would no longer give ourselves to conform to the ways of this world, but we would see Jesus and who he really is, that he is sinless, He is perfect. He has always pleased God the Father. He is the Son of God. He is God. Jesus, we exalt you. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. You have been given a name above every name. I just pray that your love and your lordship is exalted in our lives. If we are going to be called, if we call ourselves Christians, Lord, let us actually follow you and believe and listen to what you say and do it. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only he who does the will of my Father. So Lord, we ask to do your will. We ask to know you so that we may enter your kingdom. We ask you to bless us as we leave here. We ask to be transformed. For you to transform us into once caterpillars, we would now become butterflies, new creatures in Christ. So we thank you for all things. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. May you drive home safely.